Uh, and so today we have the pleasure to welcome Bruno Levy, uh, who is director of research in RIA, previously in, in Nancy, now in Orsay. And so he's going to talk about optimal transport schemes for uh, fluid mechanics, basically, and physics in general. So, so thank you very much, uh, Jean, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Thank you very much for coming. I hope that uh, we are, uh, well, it will be uh, the, uh, not too hot today. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't open the, the window, but uh, yeah, okay. So, and thank you very much for uh, coming. I'm very happy to to talk about uh, this uh, these topics, and we have been thinking for for a while about uh, how we could uh, use optimal transport to to simulate different physics. Uh, so here is the outline of my presentation. And so first, the, the motivation. The motivation. Uh, there is a, an experiment uh, that was done by uh, Hélène de Maleprade and co-workers about uh, droplet hurdle race. And basically, you create a tiny slope uh, of uh, some material. You create obstacles here, here, here. And uh, you are going to, uh, to create tiny drops of water and observe how they move along the obstacle. And it does something very, very funny, just like that. So I, I think I can uh, I can show the the real video. It will be clearer. Uh, can okay. So here it what it does. I like the way it's like swinging its its tail. I, I find it very funny. And uh, so at that time I was uh, trying to simulate some uh, some free surface fluid, and a guy on Twitter. Uh, contacted me. Did you look at that? Uh, can you simulate that? So it was, uh, and then uh, I started uh, trying to simulate that. This is uh, this is one uh, of the origin uh, of this uh, of this project. Uh, another motivation, something we have started uh, with uh, Roya, who is who is here, is about how to use optimal transport uh, in uh, in cosmology. And uh, so there is a very nice connection between uh, optimal transport and the principle of least action, for, for instance, that we can exploit to, uh, to do some, uh, some uh, simulations and, uh, and computations. So there is an inverse problem uh, that is reconstruct uh, the, the trajectories of the galaxies from uh, a map of the, the universe. There is also a direct problem uh, that is explore some uh, modified uh, laws of, of gravity. It's something we are very excited about. Uh, so here is one of the reconstructions, the so 2D example, so that we can see what happens. And so the, the bright dots <coughs> correspond to galaxy clusters, and uh, you can see the, the reconstructed uh, trajectories. Okay, so what is the connection between both? Connection to both is nearly the, the same uh, the same equation. They are very similar. The first uh, because what we have here, uh, the first equation this is simply uh, Newton's second law, F equals ma. So this is the acceleration, but the acceleration. So there is du dt, u is uh, the velocities, du dt of course. Plus there is here a corrective term. Uh, because we are in uh, in Eulerian uh, coordinates, so you need to uh, to add this term to think to the uh, uh, into account the fact that uh, we are not looking at a single particle and speed uh, velocities. But uh, I like to think about that uh, if you are uh, looking at the river you are, and you are looking at the fluid that flows uh, to you uh, under the the bridge. And you look at this uh, fluid through a grid that is attached to the banks of the of the river, and uh, and you look at the particle that crosses an intersection in the grid at a, a specific time. And when you go from t to t plus dt, the particles move the way, and it's replaced by another particle. And the fact that it's replaced by another particle is taken into account uh, by by this term. So this is acceleration. And so, and then uh, the right-hand side term is, is forces uh, for F equals, uh, uh, equals MA. Uh, so here it was for a fluid 
Uh, so you can have uh, gravity <coughs> and you can have a gradient of, of pressure. Uh, for, uh, for the universe, you, you get a gradient of gravitational potential. And here you get another term that takes into account the expansion of, of the universe. But you see the left hand side are the same, the right hand side are nearly different. Uh, the second equation, uh, so okay, so this one is already uh, done, okay, it's here. Uh, the third equation, now you get a Poisson equation for the potential, so it should be different for uh, fluids and for uh, gravity, but it's still a, a Poisson equation. And uh, this one is conservation of, uh, of mass, conservation of, uh, of matter. And so this one is exactly the same in both cases. So this is, this is how uh, I got interested in both phenomena, because they are governed by uh, the same uh, type of, of equation. And uh, so something uh, we wanted to, to do, to, to do this computation, uh, was to have a, a Lagrangian mesh so the idea is, instead of using a Eulerian grid that is like my uh, network of wires and uh, observe the, the fluid flowing uh, in it, uh, I think it was interesting for us to imagine having uh, a fluid decomposed into uh, cells like that, and imagine that the cells will follow the, the motion of the fluid. It's interesting because with, if you do a Eulerian simulation, you need to rediscretize the fields again and again because the, the fluid moves around the grid and uh, this is problematic. But if the, the grid follows the fluid, uh, it will be easier, let's say, to, to conserve volume, for instance. So here in this experiment, uh, you simulate a heavy fluid on top of a light fluid. They want to exchange po position. And it's very difficult due to uh, fluid incompressibility. And uh, so it will create uh, a lot of, uh, of turbulence, of uh, complicated uh, structures. It's, it creates a, an instability. And here you can simulate this kind of phenomena with, with it. I will show uh, some, some more simulations. And so the idea is you want to, to construct a, a mesh like that, which will be composed of cells. And uh, there will be a fluid element. So since it's a quantity of fluid, it should, uh, let's say, it, it, if we consider it models uh, a, a huge number of atoms, uh, uh, during simulation, it will always uh, model the same uh, number of atoms. They are not allowed to exchange atoms. There are other schemes where they can, huh, but uh, in, uh, in this one, they, they can't. And uh, so since our liquids are incompressible, uh, they will have a constant volume. And then we, uh, this is a, what we want to have, is a, a set of parameters. You can imagine it's a handle. And then I can grab my volume of fluid with this handle and then move it around like, like that. Tuk, 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 tuk. And while I'm moving it around and moving also the other ones uh, around, uh, they will keep their volume constant. They are allowed to change shape but they, they are going to keep their volumes constant. And so it's going to look like that. And this, these black points, they are not really points. They are rather a handle or a set of parameters. And then the question is, once you manage to, to define an object that is like that, a parameterization of the fluid uh, decomposed into a set of cells that uh, keep their volume constant, uh, you will plug the laws on physics onto the black points and uh, uh, so, so that it will steer, in fact, this parameterization to, to stimulate the, the physics of, of the fluid. And uh, now, but if you imagine that the, the points are, uh, are real points now, imagine uh, they are a set of points with, with a mass, you could do a semi implicit layer uh, simulation. So, for each time step, uh, you move from t to t plus uh, delta t. You compute the, the forces, you update the accelerations, 
you update the, the speed and then you update the, the position. Super simple. Uh, we will need to make it a bit more complicated uh, after that, but super simple uh, simulation. This is what is used in video games <laughs> for games physics. Huh? The, the Mario uh, that jumps, it, it uses a, a scheme like that. It's no more complicated than that. Uh, this is something uh, you can do in the, in the program. Maybe I can show it since we got some time. Uh, let me take the, you know, uh, 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 so, so let's say, okay, I'm taking, check, does it show up here? So I'm taking uh, a set of points. They got uh, velocities here, they are, you know, velocities are weight, so I need to update like that, uh, that, that, that it will be. And uh, well, here I've got a set of points, initial velocities, and by playing the algorithm uh, I, I just showed before, well, it does this kind of, of things. Super simple to program, and it will be uh, three lines of, of Python, and, and it, it were three lines of Python, we can do uh, this type of, of physics. Uh, so it's not super realistic, but uh, uh, if I, if I do, uh, if I take a larger number of points now, uh, and uh, if I compute the collision between uh, all these points, then it starts to, to resemble uh, a fluid. But if I wanted a realistic fluid, I need to, to simulate more complicated physics, and I would need a huge number of, uh, of little balls. And so here, you don't want to do that. So this is why I'm decomposing the, the fluid into cells and uh, trying to integrate the laws of physics into these cells to, to have a coarser representation of the, of the physics. Uh, so so here, we, here we are. And so how can we construct this parameterization uh, of the mesh that depends on, uh, on some points and uh, so that I can move the points around and uh, it, acts in, uh, it acts like handles to, to move myself. First thing that comes to mind is the Voronoi diagram. Voronoi diagram, it resembles the, this constraint, but there is something that you can do easily with Voronoi diagram. Uh, that is controlling the volume of the cells. Uh, here you see some of the cells, they, they, are, they got tiny volumes. If I cluster the points in certain zones, it will create small cells and big cells. So you can't use uh, directly Voronoi diagrams for, for that. And uh, Voronoi diagram, so it's defined la like that. Huh? Uh, it's a partition of uh, the space into different cells. And one of the cells is, uh, for instance, the, this one, the set of points that are nearer to this dot than to all the other dots. So this is for uh, Voronoi diagram. So with this one, I cannot easily control the volume. But if you do, uh, ah yes, and uh, in terms of uh, of function uh, minimization, uh, you can think about this guy as the the two D projection of three uh, D diagram. And this diagram is just the uh, the, the plot of the functions uh, square distance to each of the points. And then if you look at that from, uh, from uh, below, uh, at each point you only see one of the parabola, the ones that is uh, nearer to you, and you see this, this diagram. Uh, but something you can do is to, to add a parameter here, uh, in the definition of the cells, what it means, it means that from the point of view of this diagram, you are going to take your parabola, some of them you are pulling them or pushing them. And if I'm doing them pulling, pushing, it changes the, the area of the, of the, the Boronoi cell. It's interesting. Then I remember I wanted to control the volume. And here it's cool because I've got my, my Voronoi diagram and it's like I have I did a set of uh, tuning buttons, dials. There is one dial per, per cell. And then, then I can, uh, maybe I can tune these dials to obtain uh, the volumes I want to, to, to obtain. And in fact, actually, it's possible because there is a theorem that says that for, for any position of the point, for any 
target volumes provided that they sum up to the total volume of the domain, there exists a way of tuning the buttons in such a way that my cells have exactly the, 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 right, uh, the right volume. There are several ways of proving that. Uh, there, is a, there is the Brunier way, this polar factorization theorem. It's quite an abstract theorem that proves many, many other things as compared to, to this one. And there is also uh, a specialized version of this theorem by uh, Oren Hammer, Hoffman, and Aranoff, where people who studied a lot these Voronoi diagrams and uh, modified Voronoi diagram. So I will uh, give an idea of this proof because it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, visual in, in uh, the way to, to understand it. Uh, so uh, some summary, Voronoi diagram cells can have different sizes. Optimal Laguerre diagram, this is called the Laguerre diagram, cells have the same uh, area, for instance, or they could have any target area, provided that my targets, uh, the sum of all the target volumes uh, corresponds to, to the, the unit square. Mm. So how it works? Uh, it, it works uh, uh, by uh, studying a certain function, it's written like, like that, uh, and uh, proving that this function is concave, and proving that, uh, so it's concave, so it looks like an inverted uh, parabola. And that the tip of the parabola, if you compute the gradient of this function, this gradient of this function says that the difference between what you want to have and what you really have is zero. So you, you have what you wanted at the maximum of this function. So how it works? Uh, so uh, how it works, so you consider a uh, parameterized function. So my function ft, it depends on the tunings of all my tuning buttons. This is a vector w that indicates all the dials where uh, they, they are tuned. Uh, it depends, and it depends also on t. So it's parameterized by an assignment. So what is an assignment? It's a function that maps any point of my square to one of the dots. So for instance, here is an assignment that would correspond to a Voronoi diagram. The, the assignment can be uh, anything. It can be very artistic, like that. It's not necessarily continuous, huh, by the way. So uh, t can be uh, any assignment. And then we look at uh, this, this uh, quantity. So it is psi, psi yeah. is the value of the dial at t, t of x. x is a point, t of x is the assignment, so the, the dot, uh, this point corresponds to through, through t, and psi is the value of the dial attached to, uh, to, to, to t of x. And so if you look at this quantity, so it's interesting because uh, we can think of it as a, a, a family of, uh, of linear function because uh, for, uh, uh, for, a fix, for a fixed t, ft of w is linear in, uh, in, w, in w. So this is a very abstract uh, drawing uh, here. W, this axis is in fact of dimension n, corresponds to all the, the, the values of, of w. And uh, this axis is in function uh, of t, so it's even larger than that. It's all the possible assignments. And then, uh, if in if so all in through all the possible ft of w, I am uh, fixing t and varying w. Ft of w is linear. It's easy to check by uh, by calculation here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also now, and all all these uh, ft of w's they correspond to different t's. Uh, each straight line here corresponds to. Uh, a, a different a different map and uh, so ft of w is linear in w now if i do something else so i'm slicing it this diagram in the other direction i'm considering a fixed w but now i am varying t i'm considering all the possible uh, assignments and then it's easy to check that f tw of w so what is tw this is the assignment 
defined by the layer diagram. You, you know the diagram where I have been pushing, pulling the, the parabola, defined by the, the tuning buttons. So this is very specific uh, uh, assignment. And among all the possible assignments, it's easy to check by looking at the integrand that this, this ftw of w minimizes ftw for a fixed w. So then we are done. And this is a very simple geometric argument. And if, uh, because uh, the function we are considering corresponds to ftw of w. So this is the lower envelope of a family of a linear function. So it's a concave function. So it's interesting. So we know it's concave. So there is a unique maximum. Excellent news for, 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 for us. Uh, okay, so uh, the graph looks like, looks like that. And then the other thing that we can do, well, in fact, the function we are considering is not exactly this one. You need also to add the sum, uh, the, the sum of the, the, target, uh, the target volumes uh, here, uh, uh, times the, the actual uh, volumes. Uh, and then you can compute the gradient, and this one, yes, yeah, sorry, this one is still concave because I just added a linear function to a concave function. Now I'm considering the gradient of this function. Gradient of this function, uh, it's quite easy to obtain. There is the envelope theorem that tells you that the gradient of the half of a family of linear function is the, line, the, the linear function that realizes the half. So the basically the, the slope of, uh, of the linear function that realizes this half, and then you find this expression. So this one is the target volume, and this one is the volume of the, uh, of the cell. So good news, means when we maximize the function, gradient is uh, zero, and uh, this is what you get, this is what you wanted. And so you, you got what you wanted. <laughs> And uh, so then, summary. Um, yes. uh, so, so the way to uh, to find our tuning buttons is by uh, maximizing uh, this function. So the size are the values uh, of the of the function, basically. Uh, the function is concave. And uh, this gradient says that you got what you wanted at the, at the maximum. Okay, so now uh, how can we uh, use, use this scheme to, uh, to do our simulation? Because now imagine we got, uh, we got a machine, you can think about it, at a machine. I give, it, I give to the machine some position of the points, it cranks the machine, and it creates a, a mesh such that all the cells have the volumes that I wanted. I need to solve an equation for that, but it's a smooth concave equation, so that's mostly fine. Costs a bit, but that's mostly fine. Uh, now, how can, how can we use that to inject some physics, I would say, to move the handles in such a way that the cells uh, simulate the, the physics? And so for that, there is a there is a, a numerical scheme due to uh, Galouette and Merigo, and they can prove uh, for uh, Euler, Euler fluid uh, that doing uh, uh, there is uh, uh, doing something quite quite simple, and uh, that is basically uh, putting a little spring attached to each point to the centroid uh, 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 of its cells, uh, you got something that probably converges to the actual solution of the incompressible Euler equation. Uh, so now the question we had uh, was how can uh, you use this scheme to do uh, fluids with free surfaces uh, to simulate splashes or things like that. So there were uh, several methods that were developed to, to do that. One possible idea is to say, okay, uh, uh, imagine my fluid is, uh, is this square, and there is air around it, and I'm going to simulate air particles. You had uh, a large number of air particles. You got air particles everywhere. 
even where there is the fluid, because actually, in the end, this will be a, a Lagarde diagram. You remember my, my parabolas, and uh, the parabolas that correspond to the fluid are pulled more towards me than the air particles. So then you don't see the air. Uh, the, the fluid masks the, the air in the cell. And so, uh, and, uh, and so I said uh, that the, the function g that we maximized, uh, in fact, is a, is, is a Lagrange multiplier. It's a Lagrange multiplier with constraints that say that each cell should have the target volume. And uh, for the air, uh, you do the same, but you add a single Lagrange multiplier for all the air. Then you say that the sum of the uh, volumes of the air particle should be equal to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 0.75 as the area of, of the square. And in more physics uh, intuition, it means that air particles they can exchange matter at no cost. In a, in, a, in a certain sense. And then this works because this is mostly uh, the, the same mass. All the, the theorems we have, they still apply uh, in, uh, in this situation. But it's a bit problematic because uh, you see here, I need to add a, a large number of uh, air particles. So it, it's going, I need to compute uh, like air diagram. It's going to cost uh, a lot. So is there something we can do? Is there something we can do which is crazy? There are too many air particles. So I'm going to take an infinite number of air particles. Sounds crazy. Uh, but in fact, if you do that, and if you do the math, uh, then you see that uh, while well, all the air particles, they got a single uh, Lagrange multiplier. And so you can think of them of having tiny parabolas. They are like that. And, uh, and so the surface that I can see from this parabola is a little uh, bumpy. And so imagine I put more and more particles. So, so I've got my bumps become tinier and tinier. And my Lagrange multiplier corresponds to how much I push or pull uh, this surface. With an infinite number of particles, the surface be becomes a plane, a perfectly flat plane. And then uh, the boundaries of the cells here they simply correspond to the intersection between this plane and, and my parabolas. And in fact, they are circular arcs. So then it, it, it's cool because we can uh, uh, directly compute these circular arcs instead of uh, having these particles, and we, we, we don't need to represent these, these, these uh, additional particles uh, explicitly. So here is, a, is a, my graphic representation of, uh, with an additional dimension. Huh? You can see, well, and actually, I didn't tell you everything about these um, Lagrange multipliers. Uh, I could take this diagram and translate it as much as I want along the z-axis. I will see the same uh, drawing here. And so, in fact, there is a, an invariance uh, with respect to a translation for my Lagrange multiplier. And so, in fact, in practice, you can decide that the, the plane that corresponds to the air is at z equals zero, and you constrain all the rest. And then you, you just need to push and pull your, your parabolas. Some of the parabolas are isolated in the air. If you can think of a splash of a, of a droplet, it will create a, a, just a circle like that. And you say this, this uh, droplet should have a volume equals to uh, whatever. And then you, you just pull your parabola in, in order to reach uh, the, the, this quantity. And uh, in the zones where they touch, it's more complicated. And then you need to solve uh, an equation. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, the, the drawing we cannot take out. Well, so there are, then, uh, there are some, uh, there is a bit of computer science in there, is how can we compute the intersection between the cells and uh, these balls? Because this is, uh, this is what we need to, to compute for, for ourselves. There are several ways of, of, uh, of doing that. There is, there is the elegant way, and there is uh, my way, which is more brute force uh, way. A friend of mine is, is working on the elegant way, so I've got to, it has good chances to, to, work, uh, to work well. But I will present uh, to you my brute force way. My brute force way is already have code that computes intersection between uh, half spaces. And then the idea is simply to approximate a ball with a certain number of half spaces, and then chop, chop, chop clip the, the parts of the cells that go uh, outside my approximated ball. In practice, it's simpler to implement and uh, it works quite well. 
So uh, to do that, you need ways of representing the intersection between uh, half spaces. So uh, th these are convex polytopes, like this guy. And uh, an efficient representation is to say, in generic position, each vertex of a convex polytope has three neighbors. And three neighbors, and so it's, it's very convenient because if you need to store that in the data structure, you see it's polygons with different number of ages. It's not very convenient to implement in terms of computer uh, data structure. But then if you, if you look at the points and represent their connection with the regions, these are triangles, red triangles that, that are here. And then you get uh, always three. It's easier to, to manipulate in terms of, of data structure. And in fact, what I represent is this uh, dual triangulation. And in this triangulation, the vertices correspond to the face sets and the edges correspond to the edges, but but flipped uh, like that, and it's easier to, to represent. And then you can write the operation that takes one of these convex polytope and chop, chop it, uh, clip it with a half space. So in the first phase, so, so my half space corresponds to the supporting plane of these blue polygons. And I've got some points, the highlighted points, they are nearer to you than to the rest. And so they are on the wrong side of this clipping plane. And so in the first step, you identify them, then you, you kill them. And in fact, it digs a hole in the triangulation because these points, they are triangles in the triangulation. You dig a hole, then you insert, create a new vertex that corresponds to the, to the clipping plane, connect it to all the, the points here, and uh, this, this defines the, the clipping, uh, the clipping operation. So after that, there is a bit of uh, computer science cooking uh, for uh, for that because uh, we do that with Roya. We do we do this kind of things with billions billions points, and and so if there is a chance that an error occurs, even one over one million, if you do them billions times, it's it's it happens one thousand times. And so there is something a bit crazy about uh, doing computations. Uh, with floating points, but uh, that are probably equivalent to what we do, we would do with real numbers. So there is a, a so it's, it's very frustrating because you write maybe a, a lot of code that will be only executed in 0.0001% of the cases. But if you don't do that, <laughs> then, uh, everything uh, everything crashes. And so it's just for testing this uh, crazy configuration. So. A uh, large number of clipping planes, and this very nasty configuration where all the clipping planes meet at the same point here. And if you can resist that, there are good chances that uh, things will go uh, quite well. And there is also this rather extreme case where the boundary of this domain is like a whole glass, and uh, I've got a single cell, a single cell of the mesh, uh, constrain its volume and make it pass through the constriction. And then you can still uh, you can still con conserve the volume. So these these are like crash tests, crash tests to um, to to make sure that uh, that everything will resist. And uh, so here is how the free surface looks like. It's a bit bumpy, but uh, uh, but it's interesting the way it's bumpy because uh, this is how uh, we can still use the, the nice theorems. Uh, the, that we have maybe visually <laughs> you would prefer a flat surfaces, uh, but really uh, with the free space and for straining these guys uh, to to fill uh, uh, lower uh, quantity of space and that everything is is, um, is available. Uh, this naturally makes this. Uh, the circular arcs and the spherical uh, parts of spheres uh, appear in the equation. They are really uh, the consequence of the equation. So, and the way I'm representing them, uh, they are approximated by a, a series of uh, of planes. But with, but, uh, but Hugo Leclerc, uh, who is a software developer uh, in uh, in my team, so he works with Quentin Merigo on uh, simulations of uh, crowds. And so he developed uh, a more elegant uh, version where you actually uh, represent the equation of the sphere and you can exactly compute the integrals uh, on it. So it's possible, but it costs more. 
Uh, and so now, uh, could we use that to simulate some uh, physics? Because there is the, the galouet maribo scheme uh, for uh, incompressible Euler. And so it was interesting to do such so more uh, an experiment. I've got no proof of convergence, but could, could we inject more physics in there uh, and, uh, and simulate interesting phenomena like uh, these droplets or, or things like that? And uh, so in our semi implicit Euler scheme, uh, at one point you need to compute the forces. So which forces they, they are? So there is viscosity, surface tension, pressure, and, uh, and gravity. And uh, then uh, the question is, uh, so what's that and how to compute it? We we'll start by the what's that? And so uh, when I first encountered this notion, I was very, uh, uh, I had a lot of, of questions because uh, you learn in school that there are only five forces, electricity, magnetism, weak nuclear, strong nuclear, and gravity. And then here you got Gravity, okay, it's there, but you got other words, viscosity, surface tension, pressure. What is that? And uh, so, so here I've got a, a rather naive view uh, of that. Yes. <laughs> and uh, okay, so water is, is composed uh, by a set of uh, water mo molecules. And in fact, uh, these water molecules, they are polarized because uh, the cloud of electrons and the there are more electrons around the oxygen atom and less electrons around the hydrogen atoms. And since they are polarized, uh, there are electric forces that connect them. Uh, they are not as strong as uh, chemical uh, bonds, uh, but they are still, uh, they are still there. Uh, and uh, okay, so can, you can see a fluid as a network of, uh, of molecules that are uh, connected by, by these bonds, but these bonds they appear and they disappear uh, uh, dynamically. And in fact, so it's interesting to see what happens in the fluid. Uh, in, uh, you are like on the highway, there, is two, <laughs> there are two lanes, a slow lane and a, a, fast, uh, a, a fast lane uh, of fluid. And uh, we look at what happens for the molecules, and they move like that. And if we look at these two molecules, uh, one of the fast lane, one of the slow lane, they are connected by, uh, by, by, this, uh, by, by this, um, this bond. And uh, in fact, the effect of that is that the, the slow one will tend to accelerate, and the fast one will tend to decelerate. So it's interesting, it will, it will do that. And uh, then if you write that in equation, uh, you can also consider they are at a distance h, and uh, there is a constant uh, over h times the difference of, of speed. So the force is proportional to the difference of, uh, of speeds, inversely proportional uh, to the distance between both particles, and there is a, there is a constant. And so now, uh, if we look at our born analysis, it's very naive uh, uh, derivation, <laughs> I like it. Uh, and you look at what happens for uh, two particles uh, that correspond to the dual edge, you remember, uh, the, the flipped edges. Uh, so, so if we are in 3D, uh, my white segment here, it's a, it's a surface, a little polygon. And then uh, these, two, these two points, in fact, they account for a large number of particles, and so maybe the length of uh, this line for the area of the polygon plays a role. And so, so what you want to have, so the force, the effect uh, of Vj on Vi can be, there is still my uh, constant here. So uh, there is the area of the common face or length of the common edge in uh, 2D divided by the distance times the difference of, of velocity. And then if I'm considering the net effect of uh, all uh, the neighbors on a single particle, then it's funny because what you retrieve is basically the classical finite element discretization of the Laplacian. But you, can, you could do the same computation considering a, a little square of uh, length h, do the, the, do the integration, make h tend to zero, compute a Stokes integral, and you, you, you will actually find the, the, the true uh, Laplacian. But I, I, I like it also the discrete way because I, I think it's quite, uh, quite intuitive. And so this one is the, the viscosity that tends to homogenize the, the speeds around the, around the single point. 
Uh, now there is another effect. If I'm looking at a particle in the center of the fluid, it has other uh, particles all around. And so the attraction of these particles, uh, the net effect is zero. But it's another story near the boundary of the fluid where the net effect is a force that pulls me inside towards the interior of the, of the, of the fluid. And then you can also write it with a, uh, the same kind of, uh, of integral. And then it resembles the Laplacian of the indicatrix of the, uh, of the fluid in a, in a certain sense. And so this corresponds to uh, surface tension. So then what about pressure? So pressure is the effect of all the other particles colliding uh, in, uh, in the particle. Uh, but here uh, at this scale, we just say that uh, we want our uh, volumes to conserve their, their uh, we want the volumes to be conserved. And in the galouet merigo uh, scheme, this looks like uh, a spring connecting uh, each handle to the center of gravity of, uh, of, its, of its center. So then uh, you can write uh, my super naive uh, semi-implicit Euler simulation. You just add all the forces, push the button. If you do that, it doesn't work. You, you see some particles, that, they blow away. So you divide, divide, divide the time step like crazy. If you divide it by crazy, it will work. And then velocities be, become uh, higher and higher, it blows up again. Why? Why is this so? Because this equation, um, it's uh, because of the, of the viscosity terms. Because the viscosity, it depends on speed. So this is our time derivative. And uh, so you got, you got time derivative, time derivative. And so you need a lot of precision. It's like uh, shooting uh, in directions like that. Just tiniest error in the angle and, uh, will, uh, will be catastrophic. And so then the idea is, uh, okay, uh, let's, uh, let's pretend instead of staying the velocity at the previous time step, we take the velocity, to compute the next time step, we put here the velocity at the next time step. And, uh, but then in the end, it's just a, a linear system to, to solve and, uh, and then we are done. Looks like that. And uh, then it's rather cool because uh, actually uh, this guy, which is a discretized version of my Laplacian, plays a role uh, in three different places uh, for computing the viscosity, for computing surface tension, and also for computing my function G that I need to maximize. Uh, to to create to to find the tuning buttons of my cells that should have the the correct uh, the correct volume. Uh, so here is a the simulation. So I've got the the actual video. It will be it will be more fun. Uh, So I tweet it. But it does so maybe it's a bit dark. I don't know if you can see what happens. I will do it with, once again. So it's interesting because you got different macro scale phenomena that one can observe in the fluid huh? formation of droplets, formation of cron So it's it's first thing seriously tuned to match the physics. This would uh, require more more work, but uh, this is interesting at least to see that uh, these phenomena are, uh, are reproduced. Uh, we have very good um, conservation of volume, uh, of course, and then it's interesting to see how other quantities could be uh, conserved. Then there is this story of the hurdle race, what it, what it does. So, so, and, uh, yes, in real life. So here is the real life experiment. Uh, this is the quantity. This is the viscosity quantity of glycerin you put uh, in the in the water. Uh, uh, and here is the simulation. And so here the simulation. So you see that the interaction uh, between uh, the surface of the fluid and the boundary of the domain is important 
uh, it conditions a lot what happens to the droplets. And uh, here, since we conserve the volumes exactly, and we take into account the the, the, the domain, this is uh, we can um, we we can really uh, represent this context accurately. And so, so I think uh, I think it's interesting. But again, there was no serious uh, validation of the physics parameter. Here it was uh, rather. Uh, uh, rather uh, qualitative. Okay, and uh, so I've got another video to show you this one. Present, <laughs> if you want to get rid of the presenter, there is an application. <laughs> so here, what I can show is that viscosity, you can put a very high viscosity and it still resists. And so this was interesting. It was my crash test for the uh, implicit time integration for, uh, for, for viscosity. Without it, uh, I would blow uh, everywhere in the room and uh, it would be dangerous. Uh, since it's, 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 it's. Okay, so, uh, so thank you very much. I think I will stop uh, here so that we can... How, how long do you need to make one of those videos? Uh, so it depends. Uh, so for uh, oh yes, super. So first thing, it's super slow. It's non-competitive with SPH. If you want to create video games, use SPH mm -hmm. instead. Huh? It's uh, SPH. You can do that in real time on the GPU with multi-million particles. Uh, here, uh, I'm using uh, between one to uh, three minutes per frame. Uh, so uh, so it takes it, it takes a lot of time. Huh? It's uh, it's crazy. But here the goal is uh, it is not to be uh, super fast. This is really uh, to conserve quantities. Huh? Yeah, SPM means uh, <coughs> it means uh, it's what SPM. What does that mean? Smooth particle hydrodynamics. They are basically uh, you put uh, a, a little splat. You splat a function basis around each particle and integrate volumetric uh, forces uh, on Gaussians centered on the, on the particles. So this is a smooth... Uh, the, the, the computational cost is, uh, is uh, simple? Uh, yeah, because well, you consider... So your, your Gaussians, you, you pull them a little bit uh, towards, towards zero so that they got limited uh, support. And then uh, the costly part will be just finding the neighbors of each particle and you can have very uh, efficient data structures do that on, uh, on the GPU. But then, if you do that, it's very difficult to control the volume of, of the fluid. Mm -hmm. It is completely explicit with SPM. Uh, oh, no, no, if you want to do a viscosity, uh, you need uh, implicit time integration uh, as well. Ah, by explicit, you mean the, the formula? No, I meant. Uh, yeah, there is no equation to solve to get uh, your support or, or function basis. This is why it's fast. So it's closer to like n body simulation for galaxies, <laughs> but for fluids. And if you don't know, like if you want to look online on YouTube, we have great tutorials. It's called Coding Adventure Fluid Simulations in like 45 minutes. And the guys uh, show you exactly like as if Bruno uh, had built up on the initial US simulation, but you add more and more terms and it starts to look like a fluid. But people complain about volume collapse, etc. And that's the main motivation for doing the optimal transport plan. Then there is always a question whether uh, the method is point based or uh, or something else. And so point based uh, this is you start with mass and spring which is very naive, but uh, something you can uh, implement in high school. And then you start to be uh, disappointed by, by mass and spring and say, okay, these are not only points, there is matter in there, and we need to integrate forces on, uh, on these volumes of, ma of masses. So maybe you go finite element modeling and you project your uh, continuous equ equation on a function basis, or you put tiny volumes or splats around your, your points and integrate things uh, uh, on them, this is SPH, or, uh, or you do uh, what we do, uh, which is a bit crazy, and you, you are very, 
you are very uh, violent in the way you control the volumes, and then everything follows from, uh, from that. So this is basically the, the idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you had, uh, if you have no volume constraints, but only like um, a soft constraint of volume conservation, yeah. Yeah. the volume can but not too much. Uh, like viscosity, for example, if you want to add this as a as a component of your optimization, but uh, not a hard constraint, mm -hmm. how do you do? Can you do it with your model? Or uh, well, I think it's possible because there are different. Uh, version of optimal transport. There is a, there, there are some optimal transport where, uh, where the constraint is relaxed and you can transport between uh, things of, of different volumes. So it's an answer. Or you can even do that with Voronoi diagrams. Uh, there is a researcher in cosmology, Volker Springel, uh, who, who does mm -hmm. use which are called ALE, arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian. And then the cells they move around with the fluid, but they are allowed to exchange matter. So it makes a big difference. It relaxes the constraint uh, a lot, and it's also very efficient uh, because, uh, because in fact, you don't need to solve an equation to uh, find your mesh, and uh, you just ensure that your, your mesh overall follows the movement of the fluid, and you do a little bit of field uh, interpolation, but you can do that quite precisely, and, uh, and it also works. Uh, and, and then, it, if you relax the constraint, it might get faster for the simulation, or um... probably, I, I think so. I think so. But uh, in fact, here, uh, well, all this story, uh, I was mostly motivated by something we studied with uh, with Roya, who is here, uh, which was uh, solving the inverse problem uh, of the movement of all the, the galaxies. And here we wanted a uh, mass conservation uh, building. This is, uh, and more than that, uh, if we if we make a quite simple assumption about the integrated potential, if the integrated potential is convex. Uh, we can uniquely uh, reconstruct uh, uh, the uh, the movement. It it won't be the whole motion. It will just for each point where it started from. And in terms of computational cost, so you're using, I guess, uh, some idea. <clears throat> you are using Newton scheme, what? Uh, Newton scheme developed by. So, what's the main computational uh, bottleneck in this method? It, it's running, the running time is like n log n, or uh, I mean, in, in, in practice? Or? In, in practice, it resembles n log n. Uh, well, there is no proof, huh, because there is a. But so it, mean, it, it means uh, that you, you cannot meet it. It's, uh, I mean, I, uh, I, 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 there is no computational bottleneck. Uh, I, I think that uh, well, the, the, what is the limitation? Let me start by the limitation. Uh, because optimal transport is a difficult problem. A uh, lot of people are interested in it. Here, it is only L2 optimal transport. This is the L2 metric. Because with the L2 metric, uh, the, 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 the Laguerre diagram has straight faces, and then we can compute it. If you take, let's say, the L1 metric, then the boundary between the cells, they become quadrics, then it's a nightmare to, to, to compute. <laughs> so uh, we are in a very particular case, because the, the source uh, measure is the Lebesgue measure. Well, we could, we could have something else. Huh? We could have, uh, uh, let's say, a Python-Linear function supported by a tetrahedral meshes. This will, this will still work. But well, we, here in cosmology, we got the Lebeg uh, measure because we think uh, that uh, the initial condition, the universe was rather uniform. And if you look at the cosmic microwave background, it's very uniform, which, tends, which is where this, this hypothesis come, come from. It comes from another place also. It's because if it was not the case, it would be a catastrophe. Uh, because here, tau is equal to zero at the initial condition. And, uh, and then if uh, rho was not equal to one at the initial condition, 
it, it would uh, it, it it would blow up and uh, so uh, so thank you the universe uh, <laughs> for for not breaking <laughs> the equation here uh, no but so so, so this kidding but uh, but truly yeah uh, this equation couldn't be correct if uh, the initial condition was was not uh, was not uniform but the limitation you mentioned it, it's really about the cost it's yes it is the fact that it's you, you are bound with this quadratic and two quadratic costs so it's still possible. <laughs> Uh, to do other other things, but uh, how else? As, as, uh, but well, but uh, is there any uh, any kind of interest to use other costs than L two? Uh, yes, yes, uh, there is this uh, in uh, weather modeling. There is the semi geostrophic uh, approximation. Well, the cells they depend from a, a weirder cost that is. More like L2 in uh, one direction and more like uh, L1 in the other direction. So you got uh, you got Voronoi cells that have uh, uh, horizontal walls; they are parabola, and vertical uh, walls they are uh, they are nicer. It's difficult to 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 compute. So, but uh, but Jean is trying things for for that. And uh, yes, yes no, and to be clear, you know, because Bruno said yeah, two minutes per frame, but that's if you want to be super close. Actually, if you want your your cells to have uh, you know, the correct volumes up to numerical accuracy, etc. But it's just that if you're not interested in physics, like if you do not want to convince physicists, but you just want something that looks good for video games or biology, you can go way faster. You know, that's what people at Pixar do, like uh, getting. Volumes up to five percent or what does accuracy, which would which would fool everyone in the room. That's way way faster. Like you know, you, you can take a lot of shortcuts. You you, you discretize the space you know, in a in a grid of voxels. Uh, so yes, you have different. So it's possible. It just here, it's uh, very accurate. So you can use it for like actual prediction and actual. Um... And the idea also is to. Uh, well, we we need a, a fa if if we are faster, uh, it's it's good, but uh, but we want to know whether it's correct or not. So then we got uh, a ground truth. We got the slow algorithm that computes the ground truth. Then we can try many different appro approximation schemes, and uh, we can measure whether it was uh, it was correct or not. In, in the best case, of course, we can have a theorem that says it's a good approximation. That's correct uh, with respect to what? Because in, in the end, there is still an approximation using all this model and these particles. Yes. So it may, so I, I don't see to which ground truth you can measure with the correctness. But, but uh, there is something that is important. We know that the solution to estimate the speed of optimal transport, the volumes of the cells exactly respect uh, the, the constraint. And this also corresponds to the gradient of the Kantorovich dual. Uh, so what we do, uh, we are very, um, uh, we, we say, I want the worst error, the worst cell, uh, the worst error on volume of the worst cell to be smaller than 1%. Okay, but this is for the solution of optimal transport, right? Yes. What? But, 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 and if you use uh, entropic approximation, you wouldn't be happy. And this, I don't understand why. But, uh, so, so, it, uh, maybe it would be it would be good. But if you look at this equation, uh, we can also connect it uh, to. If we analyze it and uh, do some math with it, we naturally have something that is uh, like Benamou Brony. And then we naturally want to solve uh, uh, a similar discrete optimal transport problem. And so the point, the point is in the, the approximation, you make an error. And OK, so it means that you, you could do another one using entropy. But, uh, uh, yeah, which approximation are we, are we talking about? Uh, Lagar says. Uh, they are not an approximation. In your, in your code, yes. They are not an approximation. They are not, okay. but, but, uh, why not introduce a new approximation? Uh, uh, that I can do a, a new way of seeing it. <laughs> Just finish this one. I'm completely exhausted. <laughs> uh, no, but of course, I think that uh, if I compute the No, but of course, I think that if I come back to Roya uh, with the code that has the same uh, 
interface just launch the program and it's uh, 1,000 times uh, faster, you'll be, you will, you will be happy, oh yeah, right? <laughs> but, uh, but then, okay, we started uh, from that because, well, in a certain sense, what, what, uh, what they did with uh, semi discrete optimal transport is, is very naive. It just took the math that is uh, uh, here, took the inverse problem, and then uh, solve, uh, solve the math. Uh, I wasn't creative, I just programmed the math. Uh, now we can be more creative and try to to approximate the math. But uh, anyways, this is not scientific. Uh, this is not a scientific attitude. But I was so happy and surprised that one could just program the math because this first time it happens to me. Huh? <laughs> Usually uh, in the computer graphics things I was doing before, uh, the the um, objective function was not concave. Okay, it was non-smooth. It's smooth and concave, and just can solve it. And uh, in the semi-discrete problem, it, uh, the Lagarde arm is not an approximation. This is exactly the sub-differential of the empirical uh, fun function, some of, of the Dirac masses. So, uh, and then the only approximation that is made is during the Newton algorithm, uh, the kitagawa merigo tiber algorithm. But we got a very strong convergence and uh, the convergence criterion has a physical meaning. This is the difference of volume of the worst cell. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. So, so maybe I'm too happy with what we have because... Uh, <laughs> but uh, of course, it would be interesting. And, uh, but another reason why we are not doing entropic approximation, entropic approximation it plays very well with regular grids. And you can do linear separation and things, uh, uh, thing, things like, like that. But uh, here, what we have, oh, maybe I can show you some uh, cosmology images, why not? Want to see some? Uh, yes. Tech. Uh, <laughs> so this is a. Uh, uh, so, so the good thing about those schemes is that you do not have to discretize the space. You know, the complexity yeah. is kind of linear with a number of cells. And if you want to do entropic realization or the kind of stuff that we do, you have to discretize the space. So you're going, you know, if you want to reach sub percent accuracy, you need at least like 200 pixels per cell. So if you start playing with hundreds of millions of cells, it means you play with billions of pixels, it starts to become very heavy, you know. So, but if you want to see people doing that, you just look at the Pixar paper, you know, Fernando de Gaulle, uh, 2022, 2023, and, and it, you can do it, but it's very good. Very precise. It does. It does typically magic number three iteration of Newton per type step because it figures out that it works. I can't do that because uh, so here what you have is one of uh, one uh, one of the empirical distribution I am uh, manipulating. So here what we have uh, this, this this is uh, one hundred million points. I can zoom, zoom, zoom to show you what it looks like. 100 million points. And you see that there is a variation of density that is very crazy. Uh, because gravity, when you do numerics with gravity, this is terrible. Huh? This is a nightmare for a numerist. Because uh, this is gravity, huh? uh, m1, m2 divided by uh, square distance. And, divide, and so things tend to, to come nearer to, nearer to nearer. Then you divide by square distance, divide by square distance, off. Floating point exception, not a number. This is a this simulation uh, wants to blow <laughs> in the time evolution. Here for transport, this is the same thing because here we got density that is crazy. You know how many points there are in there? I don't know, huh? but it's it's really crazy. We want to, to create a layer diagram, one cell per point, uh, where all the cells have the same volume. And by the way, I didn't say that because it's quite counterintuitive, but uh, in the Lagarde diagram, the Lagarde cells do not necessarily contain the point. And so, in fact, the, the Lagarde cells that correspond to this guy, they will be uh, maybe around there. So it's, it's crazy. So why is this so? Because, in fact, uh, from a physics point of view, when we do the inverse problem, the Lagarde cells, they correspond to the matter at initial time that traveled through space to, to reach this point. And so it can be anywhere. And uh, if you look at the equation, this is what the, the, the equation means. But you can imagine that all the points that are nearly at the same point, and you need to write some numerics that will create 
the zones of the space where uh, all these guys come from, they are nearly at the same place. It, you will be dividing by nearly zero all the time. Uh, so one way to, to do it is to say, okay, if I'm creating uh, an unstructured mesh, uh, well, you could do like octree cells, and maybe we could do anthropic uh, regularization and octree cells. This could be a, a possible way of doing that, but you need to be very creative in the way you choose the number of uh, of uh, levels and where you you do the different transition and how you integrate things where resolution changes. Here I was very more uh, brute force than that. I say, okay, let's compute just a Lagarde diagram between these points and it, it will just fill the space and we have more cells uh, where there are more points and it's much, uh, much easier. And after that, I'm stuck because I'm so happy that this is simply the, the mass that it's difficult for me to think about something else. But of course, uh, we, we may have a lot to gain in terms of, uh, of performance. It's interesting to, to try that. We could even try anthropic regularization in the layer cells. Huh? There is a survey uh, by uh, Quentin Merigo and Boris Tiber about uh, optimal transport. It shows some examples of that. You can see both the Lager cells and their boundaries are blurred because it's combining uh, semi discrete with anthropic regularization. Why, why not? Well, I didn't want to advocate uh, anthropic optimal transport, but that, that was just to understand that there was an approximation <coughs> in, the, in the scheme, which is due to the number of particles. And so I, I wanted to question why it was so important to use uh, some ah, oui. Ah, well, but in uh, fact, uh, you, you answered it. Oh, uh, ah, yeah, this is the first one I tried. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there is also, and you have to say, there is an approximation uh, to what you try to represent, but if you take the data, the data from, uh, uh, from uh, telescopes, uh, they are points, so it's no approximation. This is the data, it's the data you have. But of course, you can say that the data is a measure of uh, a larger uh, distribution and we put that in there. And maybe in the end, we will we also have anthropic regularization. I, I don't know, but uh, this is so well adapted to uh, the problem we, we, we have. Do you have some video of uh, the trajectories uh, in this kind of application? Uh, yes, I think I've got the 2D. Version in 3D, it's difficult to, to see uh, anything. Uh, I need to find it. I, I don't remember where it is. Not here. There. Yes. Okay, so, so here we go. Here I've got a, a 2D. This is this is a 2D example. Uh, so I've got both the points and the trajectories, and that. Uh, uh, the, the data was only the points, and then here we saw it's a different story from what I have told today. Here I told about simulation of fluids, and here this is uh, uh, solving an inverse problem. So it's not really, but they are common points, but it's not exactly the same story. And so we start from the points, and we uh, move them back uh, towards the initial condition uh, that is uniform, and so this reconstructs these trajectories. Uh, now, uh, what do we reconstruct? In fact, we, re we compute a potential, and the displacement is equal to the gradient of this potential. So let me show you what the potential looks like. I don't remember where I need to click. Yeah, it's here. Uh, so uh, the surface here is a plot of the, of, of the potential. And um, well, actually, it's not exactly the gradient, the potential of which the displacement is the gradient. Uh, the gradient, it's a different surface. Yeah. If you want to know where a particle comes from, you take the particle, you project it onto the, the surface here, and then you go back towards the normal vector to the surface, 
Then you, and this tells you where the particles come from. This is a, why well, it's, it's x, x squared over 2 minus potential. In fact, the equation of, uh, this, this gets you the displacement instead of the, uh, of actually where, 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 it, where it goes. And in fact, it's funny because I like that very much. If I uh, hide the trajectory, I don't remember how to do that. Uh, let me look. If I hide the trajectories, if you look at that, if you look at the, here's the drawing, uh, it, it very looks like caustics, you know, the light patterns uh, at the bottom of a, a swimming pool where light rays concentrate. And, uh, and in fact, uh, the inverse problem that we solved, you give me an image of caustics and they compute the surface of the water that generates this caustics. That's exactly the same equation here because there was my weird optical rule, which was not a uh, final uh, uh, rule, which was ting, ting, it's not, not correct, in terms of, but this is nearly the same equation. And in fact, uh, uh, there are people uh, who, who solve actually the caustics equation and they can create for you a lens. When you light it up, it will uh, create the image that, that you want by, by solving this case. It will compute the thickness of the lens that reproduces a, a certain uh, caustic pattern. This is nearly the same equation. So this is Quentin Merigo and uh, co-workers, again, uh, please doing that. Thank you, Mr. Okay, this is the, so the original image is, is a very large scale uh, um, observation of uh, so it's not an observation. So, so this one is really a toy that I made if I wanted to have a two D image. And maybe I can show you uh, less toy. Uh, but then. But the order of, uh, of distance is like huge billions of kilos. Of, uh, uh, so for this simulation, so this is 60 megaparsec. A megaparsec uh, parsec is about uh, uh, three, four light years royal. Is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. I, I'm never sure. So, uh, so, so uh, 200 uh, uh, million light years. Okay, okay. so you don't even see galaxies. Uh, no, just, uh, each point is a cluster of, of yeah. galaxies. But now, what we are doing yeah. now, we are trying to get more resolution because the goal is to have several points per galaxy in order yeah. to be able to measure the angular momentum of the galaxy. Because yeah, because that's not my question, because you don't see any uh, periodic uh, motion, like in gravity, you really uh, But uh, here, here, what I'm showing is the inverse problem. So for the inverse problem, there are two different things. There is the actual motion, and there is the coupling, which is, uh, uh, we are here, where, where did we come from? Where the matter for when galaxy come from? So clearly, you can compute a very uh, simplified caricature motion, which is linear interpolation between where you come from and where you, you went. But you can also inject higher, uh, higher order dynamics, higher order perturbation theory to, to reconstruct more, more interesting motions. Because in fact, potential that we compute, uh, I, you can think about it as a, uh, if, in the caricature, it's like a clip that you do at the initial, uh, the initial um, uh, condition, and then, and then nothing interacts. You don't, you don't do anything else that kicking. What is the, what is the kicking uh, that brings you from the, from the level of measure to uh, a given uh, uh, empirical uh, observation? This is what we saw, but then this is no realistic uh, motion. After that, you need to work more to uh, to say. Uh, yeah, but it's still gravity in the equations. Uh, yeah, but gravity appears in a particularly integrated manner. And that, then, if you want to know the evolution of gravity, you need to reintroduce time in the equation and uh, have, a, have the evolution. Because it's just the integrate. The double integration of uh, acceleration with respect to time and it tells you uh, displacement, basically. And uh, the important thing is that, provided that the doubly integrated potential is uh, convex, uh, you can uniquely reconstruct uh, the, the coupling, which is, which is good news. 
Generally speaking, it's not exactly the, the case, huh? uh, but it's nearly the case. And when we validate that uh, with numerical simulation, uh, we got quite good uh, agreement with, uh, in fact, uh, Roya does the simulation. She lets her computer uh, run for, uh, for two weeks. She gives me the results. I go back in time uh, with this one, give to her the reconstructed initial condition, she compares, and uh, there is good agreement. And more than that, if she hides in their secret signal, uh, then we retrieve the secret signal. So the very unique of the secret signal. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you mean? what do you mean by secret signal? So, so this is something, uh, so this is uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the universe, tell me if I say <laughs> things that are not correct. Uh, light and matter uh, were interacting a lot because uh, it was like a plasma and the, the, the nuclei and the electrons were not coupled together. So you got a soup of nuclei and electrons and photons there and they built into a, a, everything the light couldn't escape. But you know, there's a pressure of radiation photons. The, uh, if you create a a huge sail and you go to space and uh, the light pushes you it can accelerate very very fast with that and uh, and uh, in in a plasma uh, this pressure is non negligible and uh, and so you you had two things that were uh, acting there was this pressure of radiation and was make, making things tend to um, to um, to grow and uh, gravity uh, making things tend to uh, collapse. And when two things are acting in two different ways, it's a good way of creating waves. And these waves, they are like sound waves because this is a, a, a zone of higher pressure that propagates in the, in the plasma. Same equation as a sound, sound wave. And then you wait a little bit, uh, 300,000 uh, uh, years, and then everything cools down a little bit. The electrons start to turn gently around the, the nuclei. Then the light can escape, but it stops interacting with, with matter. So the sound wave, they stop propagating. But you get zones of, imagine drops of water that, that fall uh, in, in a lake. You will see a lot of uh, rings of water like, like that. So this is picture you can imagine of this, uh, this zone of density. And then the universe continues to, uh, to expand. There is a global expansion of the universe. All these circles, they expand, and then interact a little bit with, uh, with gravity, so they are deformed, they are slightly blurred. But this is a signal we can still uh, observe today, that we can uh, reconstruct also when we go back in time. So we, we go from the large deformed uh, circles, or shells, they are spherical shells, in fact, and uh, when we go back in time, we see whether we can see the clearer picture of the smaller but uh, more contrasted uh, uh, sum, uh, sum of circles. And so this is a statistical uh, test that you do. You measure the probability of finding two particles at a certain distance in function of the distance. If you look at this graph, there are big hubs like, like that, and this is a signal, this is a secret signal like <laughs> to, to reconstruct. Uh, do, you have, uh, do you have an idea to have a um, smoother surface? You have, uh, like uh, using an infinite or n one now, because when you show the water surface, you have bumpiness. What? You have uh, some idea to impose that? But so, uh, what? So, uh, in our case, we didn't want a smoother surface because this is the actual surface. Why is the surface bumpy? Uh, because we get super high concentration of matter in tiny spaces. And so this means that uh, what we compute the subdifferential is the generalization of the gradient. And in fact, uh, for a point, you get like several derivatives. And so these derivatives they correspond to points in space. And so for a single point, you get uh, a volume in space that, that, that is associated to, to the point. And the bumpiness, you can see, is the connections between all this, uh, these volumes. Uh, but if you take, of course, you can take also optimal transport for uh, transporting uh, plain old uh, continuous smooth function to a plain old continuous smooth function. And then the 
the surface of the water will, will be smooth uh, as well. Not, not necessarily everywhere, hein, because matter can split and merge, and each time it splits or merge, there is a with C0 and not C1. Um, and the height of these bounds would reduce if we increase the number of Lagarde cells, right? Uh, if, we increase number, if we increase the number of particles to the simulation, those bounds should be small, right? Ah, uh, well, yes, uh, yes and no, because if you, even with a large number of particles, if you let gravity do its job, you, you get super, uh, super high density of, of matter. So, um, oh, uh, talking about the surface of water. Uh, but even surface of water, because for surface of water, if you think at a galaxy cluster, for instance, there's a galaxy cluster, and there is a region of space that collapsed. Uh, to form this, uh, this, this, this cluster of galaxies. And the function is, is the piecewise quadratic function, and the pieces correspond to the re these regions of space. And so you can think of uh, quadratic functions stitched together on a, on a Voronoi like uh, diagram. Yes, but uh, what I'm asking about is about your hydrodynamical simulation, not for cosmology, but for ah, yes. uh, so, so water surfaces. And you've shown that we have bumps. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, from physics, we expect water surface to minimize its what? area. So what? Sh there shouldn't be any bumps. And I'm asking whether if we increase the number of cells, well, yes, yes. these bumps will reduce. And thus, in the limit of infinite cells, will then have well, a smooth surface. Uh, yes, uh, yes, right. Sorry, I didn't get the question in the first place. Of course, if you the bumps will be, uh, but in fact, this may be not the, the answer. Uh, so there are uh, papers by these guys uh, who now try to what would you uh, would you have uh, with an anisotropic distance in there, and uh, maybe it's a way of making the less bumpy. Because in particular, I've got uh, linear speed of convergence. Order one convergence with respect to the number of particles. I would prefer to have quadratic, and for that, uh, we need anisotropic stuff. But again, this is a nightmare of computing intersections between quadrics. It's, uh, it's crazy. So maybe yes, it's, it's, so it's especially like in, in front one, but uh, basically, the idea is that we started to play with uh, by discretizing the space. And so, if you discretize the space, you, you are not constrained to quadratic cost functions anymore, so we play with anything. And the first remark is that okay, you can start playing one around with anisotropic cost functions, but also you change if you change the exponents of the distance, it makes uh, the, the cell more or less soft. And actually, you can see that basically, even if you stick to uh, uh, normal distance, so everything that Bruno showed was for the square distance. But if you take distance at the power four or ten, you're going to get very hard cells. So they, they, they it's like a piscine à boule. Uh, so the, the, the kind of stuff <laughs> when you swim, you know, when you're young, when you lots of so kids when you want to. <laughs> there's lots of uh, plastic spheres, you know, that uh, you know, they're there. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you use uh, distance at the exponent one point five or one or something like that, you're going to get very squishy spheres. And so you have uh, pictures uh, in, the, in the paper, and yeah, probably it gets flatter. Uh, I, I found it. For me, flatter. <laughs> this is very, one of the big challenges to, to, to have a tool where we could uh, change the distance function mm -hmm. uh, that behaves more or less like uh, uh, semi discrete. So maybe uh, entrop entropic regularization, maybe discretize and grids, maybe. Uh, the tricks that work will work. Huh? So, this is, there is no a priori uh, uh, of what we will work, and uh, trying that will be super interesting to, to have. Just a very small question. Uh, I got the same problem with understanding surface tension and viscosity and stuff like this. So, have you tried to simulate mixture of fluids with different surface tension and viscosity? Not yet. Not yet because well I need to work more. Hein? What I've shown is like a caricature uh, explanation of but the, the phenomena. Would work, right? uh, yeah, 
But I think that the, the true thing is not very far away. But if you look uh, at, um, well, there is this linear Jones potential eh, for interacting yeah. particles where it's uh, attractive but repulsive uh, at a certain distance. But this, this one is, is not, uh, it's an empirical law. Yeah. But, but it's, uh, and so uh, you need at some point to, Maybe uh, maybe you can invent also new empirical laws that, that work well. Huh? This is a... <laughs> it's true that there is a need for uh, validating things in this method and to, to see whether they are interesting, competitive. Uh, so in, in the end, I think for the surface tension, you can validate very qualitatively, very just you simulate a droplet and what? measure some angles, what? and if it's the right angle, then the model what? is... Okay. There is also a uh, droplet uh, without um, uh, without gravity, mm -hmm. uh, droplet in space, so oscillates at uh, yes. certain uh, frequencies that depends on uh, viscosity, surface tension. And that, uh, this is the way they, they validate the simulation. Mm -hmm. You told me that they have standard benchmark suits, yes. basically, uh, when you have maybe close one solutions. Okay, so, uh, so uh, with the viscosity, you have an implicit uh, scheme, and you what? have to solve uh, 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 a linear problem. The size of your linear problem is the number of your uh, cells. Exactly. So uh, you have how, and you have to solve one per time step what? of the integration. What? So uh, what's the, how many cells do you have? So it can be, for what I have shown, it was between 1 million and 10 million steps. And but, how many time steps? Uh, maybe a few thousand time steps. But the, the system is very sparse. Okay. Hein, because the, the non-zero pattern corresponds to the, the edges of the mesh, basically. So you yeah. have a specific rotation? Uh, yeah, it's ouais, 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 sparse. Hein. So it's Laplacian, so you can rely on the numerical algebraic uh, libraries Okay, it's for better than inverting uh, yes. term, uh, Gaussian terms. Yes, things yes. like that. It's better. Well, in fact, what I was using at that time uh, was a simple uh, preconditioned conjugate gradient solver. It works quite well. But what I am using now, it's an algebraic multigrid solver, and it's just crazy fast. I really want to know. It's, it's pretty scary. Algebraic multigrid. Uh, so the idea is you... Well, uh, the idea if you want to solve a Laplace uh, equation on a, on a tiny grid, uh, and you do that with an iterative method. Let's say you want to smooth the mesh, this is a tiny grid, you pick the central point, you pull it like that, and you want to say, I want to minimize the, the Laplacian. And you visualize the iterations of the iterative solver. If you start to make waves, and it will take a huge amount of time, convert these waves will grow bigger and bigger and merge together. And uh, basically, it, it does uh, like a Fourier transform uh, with um, the fine frequencies first. And it's a pity because what you want is the coarse frequencies. And then the idea is what, what if instead you represent a hierarchy of meshes with big cells and small cells, solve first on the small cells, converges very quickly, then refine, uh, do a few iterations, refine, do a few iterations. This is a multigrid method. Okay. And, uh, and uh, it can solve the Laplacian is linear, in linear time, which is uh, amazing. Huh? Uh, linear time, uh, you solve uh, a PD. But what if you don't have a regular mesh? This is my case, and I've got a Voronoi like diagram. Uh, it's possible to, to analyze the non zero pattern of the matrix uh, as if it was a mesh and uh, then lump some coefficients to create coarser matrices and it creates internally, I have not programmed it, hein, this one. Uh, the first one, uh, conjugate gradient, I have programmed it, but this one, because it's crazy, there are many parameters. I don't like it when there are too many parameters. <laughs> but then you got the hierarchy of matrices and it, it does the same thing as what I was saying, with pulling a point and a coarse uh, versus fine. It's super fast. I was amazed there. With the experiments we did with uh, Roya for 100 or 300, we pushed it to 300 million points, 
euh, before with the first conjugate Brazilian solver, uh, uh, so far, far Nick Nikaktar, uh, the guy who was working on it, was complaining, uh, could you do something? It takes three days for uh, inverting a single problem. When we introduced the, the solver, it was less than one day. So it's really, uh, it's really crazy. What was the input? Was it quite And if you want the actual code, it's uh, called AMGCL. AMGCR. Yeah. This, this is the, you can find it on Git, GitHub. The, uh, this, is, this is C, yes. But if you don't want to do C, you can throw your matrices and vectors to a file, uh, execute the program, read back the solution, and uh, you will not lose your time. Huh? Because, uh, Thank you. Okay. Probably we are good for today. So,